somewhat embarrassed when it comes to time. I think we've got uh, uh, kind of virtually no time at all. But what I'm going to do with that uh, is I, I'm going to ask for four or five questions from the floor. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel, uh, tell the panel they've got, they're going to have no more than 90 seconds to respond to any of the points that they've heard. You can choose to ignore the points that you hear from the floor and instead respond to something else that one of the other speakers said. Um, and I'm going to ask a question as well. So we're going to do all of that, and we're going to do all of that in the next 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, is that okay? Right, so uh, we've got roving mics. I can see five hands, and those are the five. Oh, no, well, I've got to go over there. Okay, so let's start with the gentleman here in glasses. But your point is, you you've got 30 seconds to make your point. If it's directed to one particular person, tell, uh, tell us who it's directed to. It's directed to Mike and Maria. Um, we've heard today about, yesterday, about the need for a united heritage sector. Who are you, sorry? I'm Les Sparks, I chair the West Midlands Committee of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, and we've heard the need for a common language. Um, we've heard Maria talk about too many historic buildings to be able to save them all. I haven't heard Mike Clark say there's too many species on this planet to save them all. Seems to me a fundamental contradiction in approach. I won't say which, which approach I personally support unless you ask me to. Very good. Uh, okay. Um, I thought that, yeah, there's a lady, I think, around the back table there. Yep. Is this working? Yes. Yep. Kate Maver here, National Trust for Scotland. I just had a quick um, query about the venture philanthropy, which came along probably about 10 years ago, from my recollection, when it was embryonic, first thing starting up. I was interested to know, with the increase of venture philanthropy, whether the size of the cake has grown over that, say, 10-year period, now that investors are seeing there is more uh, robust business planning going on, there is more uh, that they can actually, more difference they can make with good management of good charities. And has that made a difference in the number of people willing and able to invest? And is that, is that an opportunity for the future, or has it been exhausted? Okay, as the mic's moving across, I'm going to subvert my own format and say, Dan, why don't you just respond to that specific point? Yes, I mean, venture philanthropy, you're right, was a, was a kind of new trend, and it sort of still exists. It's turned out not to be uh, as simple as some of the uh, people peddling it were, who kind of thought they were going to introduce kind of venture capital and private equity type of uh, approaches to, to non-profits, uh, and they found that quite tricky. I think a, a, a more a, a interesting trend at the minute is, is what's called impact investing, at least in the US, often social investment here. Uh, and there's been a big, uh, there was a big G8 uh, summit last year, and there's a whole working groups going on. And this is potentially trying to see um, both uh, charitable uh, funders, but also mainstream funders, whether they want to put some of their portfolio uh, into non-profits, essentially um, go going for a slightly lower financial return in return for social impact. And there's a lot happening on that. That could be quite exciting. Um, but again, uh, I would caution that a bit like crowdfunding, it's uh, talked about a lot and there's a bit less happening. Okay, this one right in the far corner there. Thank you. Uh, Chris Brown from Igloo Regeneration. I'm a property developer, but my friends tell me I'm at the more socially acceptable end of the <laughs> spectrum. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to link the three fantastic, absolutely fantastic contributions from Dan, Maria and Jonathan um, with some of the stuff we heard last night, and with particular reference to a project I'm involved with uh, called Ancoats Dispensary uh, in Manchester, which, uh, which was built at the same time that Maria's Elephant was, uh, was doing rides at Bellevue. Um, it's doing a huge, as a project, it's intended to do a huge variety of things. Um, but I guess two questions for the panel. Do you think we can ever value all the different things that some of these heritage projects do, you know, from economic development to community well-being um, to protection of, of heritage itself. It was, it was the site where Lowry painted his only ever interior, for example. How do we value that? And secondly, and I guess this may be more for Jonathan, um, is the process as or more important than the outcome? Because this is a project which is led by the community. It's not with the community, it's led by the community. So it's a process as or more important. Great, uh, there's a lady there in a kind of, I think a blue top, from what I can see. Keep them short if you can. 
Uh, Hilary Laid from the Heritage Lottery Fund. I wonder whether Maria could make a link between her very challenging provocation about letting things go and the comment made by the gentleman yesterday about class benevolence, where it's a cultured elite who take all the decisions and pass them down. Very good. Uh, we'll come to the front and we'll just take this little cluster of three questions here and then we'll bring in the panel. So there's one, two, three people, kind of just there's one on this table and there's two on that table. Oh, the two, there's two microphones converging on you. <laughs> Who's going to get be there first? Oh, yeah, you go first because you got it. Yep. Hi. Yeah, it's working. Go on. Um, I'm Lisa from Dig Ventures, um, and I just wanted to respond to several things and ask a question. Um, you can't respond to several things. You can respond to one thing. Okay, fine. I'm going to choose then that it's easy to be preoccupied with the thing when it's really about the people that matter. Um, I have to disagree, and I just wanted to share from where we've been with crowdfunding, that people come to us because they want what we've got. And I just think amongst all this, although of course I believe it is the people that matter, we have to be very careful about our USP as heritage providers. That is what we've got that nobody else has that's delivering social outcomes. And I think the reason why we fail with social funders is that somehow in trying to get those funds, we forget that and it doesn't come through strongly enough. And that's true for both audience and for funders. Okay, and then pass the microphone to the person next to you. Good morning. Um, Marcus van der Gaal from the Continuum Group. We run, uh, I'm just, the reason I wanted to speak was another proposed model and also about access to funding. We run several visitor attractions in partnership with local authorities. And uh, we invest in those facilities and then we give back to the local authorities. For instance, uh, the Spinnaker Tower in Portsmouth, we give back about 500,000 pounds every year. We're more and more talking to local authorities, trusts, and uh, the likes of the RSPB in partnership, and I think there's a lot more collaboration that can be had. Very good. We're all in favor of diverse voices. It's fantastic to have two private sector voices in this cluster of questions. Uh, true diversity for you. Um, yeah, there. <laughs> She's Conservation Trust. We're the organization responsible for all souls in Bolton, um, and we're very much in, in agreement that you have to be entrepreneurial, that the future is mixed economy, it's about you, you can't preserve buildings in aspect. However, I think there is an inherent conflict be between this desire to tidy things up from the top, to reorganize organizations, and to reduce the overall number. And I just want to posit a good case study to prove that, which is the Church of England, which owns 40% of grade, well, it doesn't own them, 40% of grade one listed buildings in this country, 13,000 parish churches. They make absolutely no economic sense whatsoever. And yet every time someone in the Church of England tries to tidy up and close three out of five of them because it looks neat from the top, the local, it's the local people that stop that. And it's, it's not because they make economic sense, it's because they love these buildings, because the beauty, the words Jonathan was using particularly, um, and, and, and it, 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 there is a conflict between that desire locally to keep your local building and the desire to tidy up from the center. Okay, so some really interesting questions. Sorry, I can't take uh, uh, everybody. Um, I think there were specific questions addressed to some of you individually, but I also think there's a kind of underlying issue here around what we mean by value and impact and the kind of dangers of trying to have too neat an account of what is in, uh, essentially a kind of rather complex uh, uh, phenomenon. But uh, let's go in the same order as the speakers. So start with you, Dan. You've got 90 seconds to respond to whatever you want to respond to, starting from now. I, I think, in a sense, we're having kind of macro and a micro conversation. I would say that as an economist. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of contributions about what are we trying to do overall? Do we have too much of certain things? Uh, what are we really trying to do? All the different outcomes that a, a heritage uh, a project or whatever can, can create. And then, uh, and, and those are very difficult, but I agree with what people have said, that we do have to confront to some extent those issues, otherwise things just happen with the most powerful attending to push the shape of what happens. Um, on the other hand, if you just ask uh, people what they want, it happens in charitable funding, they tend to fund the popular things and, they, and the less popular things never get funded and yet we think they're valuable. Then you get to the micro level, I mean, which, which church do you, you know, close down or whatever? When, when do you sort of overrule the local public? When is it true they say this is absolutely vital to us in terms of community cohesion and social capital? And when is it not true? And these things are easy to band about, uh, and people always do. I've never met a charity yet who hasn't told me that their charity does fantastic stuff and achieves a hell of a lot, and they should be the one that's funded. I mean, of course they say that, but some, if we've got rationing, and we do have rationing, 
about resources. We have to make those decisions, and some of them are tough. I think, as people have said, one of the key things is who's making those decisions. Very good. Mark? Okay, well, I think I'll respond to the point around um, saving species versus um, letting go a heritage. And three quick points, really. Um, the first is that I think just start with the natural heritage component of this. You know, essentially, species are what move through ecosystems, food webs, and natural processes. You know, our interventions are all around the processes. Um, and so um, I think there's, there's, there's a kind of distinction to be made here. Um, you know, in, from a natural heritage point of view, we envisage things moving and changing. This isn't about going back to some halcyon age and aspic and fossilizing. It's actually about how do we enable nature to adapt while retaining what we think is a test of a civilized society. I mean, I'm you know, short-circuiting, that's it. But the two points to go with this, you know, I think, that, you know, my point is I think this is around how do we create a common language, you know, common frames, you know, what are, the, what's, what are we deleting and assuming before we even speak? You know, we need to bring some of that to the surface. And I think it's around mission and purpose. What's heritage for? You know, provider or purpose? What language are we talking? Are we talking provider language or purpose language? And I think that's it, crucially about how, do we, how does heritage contribute to the future, not just what we're saving from the past. And I think just final point on that is that, um, you know, I think we do need to go back to real brass tacks on this. You know, I've, I've heard the mention the, the Age of Enlightenment may, mentioned. You know, there's something here about universal values. You know, when I think about how I connect my cause with the message to my public and the impact we have to demonstrate, it's all about the local to the global, from the individual, their home, their, their livelihoods, through to um, how that collectively makes an impact. And w I think we need to be creating a, a way of enabling us to talk in those terms if we're going to have more common purpose. Thank you. Maria? Um, I'll pick up on that point um, and, and echo something that Jonathan said, which is um, we need to remember that the Victorians knocked stuff down in order to create the heritage that we now look after. So to me, the difference between our regard of natural species and the, the heritage uh, state that we look after is that it is, it is it's a dynamic system, and, but some of the things that we do in the present are arresting that dynamism, and we need to let ourselves remember that it has always changed, and that it's a question of choosing. I'm not suggesting that we knock any particular thing down, but I'm saying that in the system that we now work in, we have to make choices about how we contribute to that dynamism. In relation to the point about um, who has the power to choose, I think one of the most productive things that has emerged over the last 20 years is a much greater engagement with the making of those choices. And actually, the actions of the Heritage Lottery Fund have been one of the best things about that. So the Ann Coates dispensary example is a very good one because it is not the people in charge, whoever they are, that are making the case for that building or against that building. Actually, the Heritage Lottery Fund's processes are open to people coming together and making a case for the future of a building. However, what my provocation was about is that even when that case is made, that doesn't necessarily add up to a sane business case. And that's the honest discussion all of us have got to own, because it seems to me that if we are to have a proper discussion about this, we have got to remember that there is not some elite in, in charge of everything. We are all responsible for this system and we all need to participate in the debate and not point the finger about at somebody else and say it's their job to save this or their job or their job. Thank you, Maria. I can't help thinking there's something symbolic about the fact you're wearing a ring that looks like a knuckle duster. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jonathan, over to you. It's funny, isn't it, how uh, one question usually catches the wind and uh, it, it, it's the one I want to address, it, it's the top dogs that do all the barking and what happens to um, the others. And it, uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm a marvellous chap at Auckland Castle because I'm almost completely incompetent at everything. I'm completely <laughs> out of my depth. And far from being a disadvantage, that means that there is an absolute imperative to build a team around you. 
And, and the truth is that people are energized by being needed. And um, I mean, somebody did some research which shows that the Mary Poppins style of management, which is, you know, you do everything from cleaning the lavatory to blessing the Pope, uh, um, doesn't work. And, and that's absolutely right, that, that we're, man is made to be a social animal. And when we show our vulnerabilities and, and, and we come with needs, you, a, a team of people can be a life force. Uh, and and uh, if and when Bishop Auckland succeeds, it will be because it's the many, not the one. Jonathan, thank you uh, very much for that. Well, it's been a, a, an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, session. Um, we're reaching an intriguing point on the agenda because it says on my notes that there's now going to be two informal chairs brought to the stage so I can interview Neil McGregor. I'm fascinated to see the nature of these informal chairs. Um, as they're brought to the stage, can I ask you to thank our wonderful panel, Dan, Mike, Maria and Jonathan. <laughs>